You're watching Neocash Radio, where we discuss the future of money today. In the studio with you, it's JJ, Darren, and Pedro. We discuss Poliniex changing of the guard. JP Morgan finally understands the disruption potential of crypto. Bitcoin SegWit adds support for segregated witness. All this and more here on episode 244 on Thursday, March 1st, 2018. Yes, in the traditional markets, we have gold down to $1,316. Silver's down to $16.46. Oil is up to $61.33. The Dow is down to 24,609 points. And the 30-year Treasury yield is down to 3.094%. And in the crypto markets, we have Bitcoin Cash up to $1,302. Bitcoin Segwit up to $10,985. Ethereum is down to $875. Dash is down to 619 and Litecoin is up to $214. Just a reminder that you can tune into Neocash Radio every week. Don't want to miss a single moment of awesome Neocash content, including special episodes and bonus interviews? Subscribe to our podcast on Google Play Music, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Podcast Addict, and more. We have video now. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, like and share the videos. Neocash Media YouTube channel. And this is, you know, I'm back from vacation. And, uh, you know, usually like the, uh, the TV shows will have like months of vacation between their seasons and whatnot, but crypto moves too fast for us to take that long of a break. So here we are, uh, and, and starting out right away, if you haven't watched our crypto warning label video, please check it out because as if we didn't warn you enough already, ICOs and token sales are inherently risky investments. This story from Bitcoin.com ought to provide ample proof. 46% of last year's ICOs have already failed. Token Data has been tracking more than 900 ICOs, and the numbers should not be that surprising. 142 failed at the funding stage. 276 have failed since then. Furthermore, 113 are are on the fence now with either no communication from the team or no community using the coins. Now, this is about... Uh, 59% or nearly two out of three ICOs have failed to live up to the hype. Now, of course, uh, the, the actual numbers for if you start a business, it's, it's, it's about the same. Maybe it's between 60 and 70% of businesses fail in their first year too. Well, with this in mind, I have some news to share with you regarding the future of Neocash Media. During my vacation, I've done some critical thinking into what sort of content I ought to create and I've decided to develop a comprehensive ICO and token sale rating system. Hopefully the content can serve as an early warning system for scams and money grabs. But uh, this this is the big news that we constantly warn people about when it comes to these ICOs and these tokens is that they can fail. You know, I don't, and I don't, we can't stress it enough. In fact, they probably will. I mean, 40% failed the first year they were launched and that's not, and then there's still the second year, so much more can fail. Only four percent more need to fail, and more than half are failing. So um, yeah, I mean, you really need to do research. There, there's a huge difference. There's a whole swath of, of difference between them. You have some with teams that have done other projects. They they have office space. They they put out regular blog posts and updates. And then on the other side of the spectrum, you have a pretty website. Uh, a, a white paper that has a lot of copy and pasting from other white papers and a little bit of social media going on and everything in between. Right. Yeah. And then see the big thing that's different with these ICOs versus starting a traditional business is that many traditional businesses, you know, they might have a little bit of capital up front, but some, many of them are, are having small business loans. Many of them are taking uh, loans out from banks without the small business uh, administration helping out. Some of them are funded through VCs, but the fact of the matter is is most of these ICOs have gotten the majority of their funding up front if they've been funded to begin with. And then they, 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 uh, most of them might fail or, or, you know, people walk away from it. Um, But then again, some of these that have failed, to be very honest, never received any funding to begin with. Their, Their project never got off ground. And some of them, I mean, they should fail. To be honest, some of these coins that are there on this uh, this this list are, are obvious no go coins that, that they aren't going anywhere. Right. I, so. I mean, it's a double edged sword. You know, being able to raise uh, capital funding through uh, initial coin offerings is great because of how easy it is. But because of how easy it is, it can attract 
people that aren't willing to put, you know, very much effort into the project other than to stand it up and try to get some funds. That's right. Well, moving on, we've got another story here. Who's got this one? Dutch financial service provider wrote, Rambo Bank is uh, guaranteeing interest in a cryptocurrency wallet service. I think we've heard okay. something like this before, JJ. Yeah. According to a statement on RoboBank's, uh, Ram, RaboBank's website, the idea of RaboBit is a cryptocurrency wallet with the online banking environment and inside uh, <clears throat> and um, in, in signing over into overall liquidity and having bank accounts and cryptocurrency in one place. There is not much more information at this time. Surprise, surprise. It's interesting to see banks start to show an interest in providing cryptocurrency wallet services. So this is an existing bank, JJ? Yeah, it's, it's an existing, you know, Dutch bank. Okay, great. And, because, and they want to start offering, you the, know, wallet, crypto wallet they're not services. Guarantee, they're, they're gauging interest. They're gauging interest, right. They haven't actually launched the, the you know, the product yet, but they're gauging interest into with their customers as to if this is a service they, they'd want to see. And I think we're going to see more banks have uh, have this interest. That's right. So this could be f- f- uh, for people who want to secure their crypto and ins- insure it against loss. Possible interest could be paid by, possibly interest could be paid by the bank. The user would, of course, lose full control over their wallet. So, yes. Right. Right. So user could, you know, they'd give up a little bit of control or a lot of control, actually, the, the private keys. But then, you know, there would be a, an insured entity that would insure them against loss. Right. Well, this is, I think, yeah, you know, this is definitely a trend that we're seeing more and more as, as more it, it, they say institutional investors. But it's not just in investors. Institutions themselves are looking at the blockchain space. And now that things have sort of, you know, the, the volatility has gone up and then down. But as more and more clarity comes through various uh, government agencies and central banks, more and more banks and institutions are looking to dip their toe in that crypto water. Well, Polyniex has been sold to Circle and backed by Goldman Sachs, Chinese internet, internet company Baidu, and more. Circle is looking to change the global economy, and owning a cryptocurrency exchange is going to give that effort a boost. We can expect increases in know-your-customer requirements that may or may not affect the volume the exchange processes. Now, Polyniex is one of the big exchanges. They, they, yeah. they, they for, for, from, I don't know if they're still number one, but for a while they've been, uh, what, what we've, what I've called, I should say, the Polyniex pump house. So it's like, uh, there's, there's a lot of coordinated pumping going on their exchange. Not to say that, that the exchange is bad, not to say that, that everyone involved in Polyniex is a bad actor, but there are certainly bad actors that have been using Polyniex to pump up uh, currencies and tokens, in addition to other exchanges. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think with this happening, you we could see maybe a little bit more, uh, you know, registered accounts sort of thing where, um, you know, people aren't just using a VPN to get into Polyniex and then, you know, doing whatever they want. So, I, I mean, this is both, you know, it's, it's sort of like... Well, the, the, the news is rife with, you know, financial companies now looking to get into the blockchain space. Some of them that were very much, you know, critical of, of Bitcoin last year. Right. So, exactly. So, so uh, speaking on that same line of thought, uh, JP Morgan sees disruption threat from cryptocurrencies. In the firm's annual 10K filing with the SEC on February 27th, quote, both financial institutions and their non-banking competitors face the risk that payment processing and other services could be disrupted by technologies such as cryptocurrencies that require no intermediation. New technologies have required and could require J.P. Morgan Chase to spend more to modify or adapt its products to attract and retain clients and customers or to match products and services offered by its competitors, including technology companies. Wow. Quote. So in other words, J.P. Morgan sees a threat to, to some of its fee revenue with crypto opening up uh, options to cut out intermediaries. And then in related news, on February 22nd, Bank of America filed its own t- 10K with the SEC, where that document also raised potential cryptocurrency challenges, including difficulties complying with KYC and AML rules when using digital assets 
and losing business to less risk adverse companies willing to try the cryptocurrency space. That's, I mean, this is a big, I read, I read that report or I read parts of it. That thing was way too long to sit there and read while I was on vacation, but I, I was definitely interested to see what they had to say. And they're very it's true. It's, it's that these, these banks have not innovated. They no. have not had to. And, and, and I think they're starting to see the threat and feel that they need to. Um, and, and we, you know, on the show spoke about the, the Dutch bank that's gauging customer interest. Well, as we reported previously on Neocash Radio, Bank Frick, based in Liechtenstein, will um, offer customers the ability to buy, sell, then hold Ethereum, Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, Litecoin, and Ripple. This is now live for those customers, and more banks are expected to follow. Right. Well, this is, I mean, all, all good stuff to, to see Liechtenstein doing this and these banks getting involved with That's, this. This is pretty big news. This is big news. And, you know, the interesting thing with Ripple is, once again, we, we talked about Ripple in the past and how you don't necessarily see the XRP being used. In fact, the newest uh, people that sign on to use Ripple aren't even using XRP because they don't have to. You don't have to use XRP to use Ripple's system. Right. And so it's, it's like, I know there's a community that's, that's around Ripple that wants to see that coin go to the, to the moon because they're holding a lot of it. But I got news for you. That's not going to happen for a while. Well, I mean, it's it's interesting the the way Ripple set up. I mean, there's a story about maybe two guys go into the restroom. One's a big Ripple fan, and the other guy says that, well, it's all f- fine and dandy. I just don't think the banks are going to use the actual token, the, the the Ripple token, because the whole idea of Ripple is you can make a basically uh, you have a system of debts where you can actually make a fiat payment by shuffling out over around some debts to, to people. And to do that, you need a very, very, very small fraction of a Ripple token. So basically, there's not going to be much demand for, for Ripple without a use case. And, and this use case of actually using the Ripple platform that consumes very little of the Ripple tokens. So, so it's, right. it's, you know, it's, it's I, I mean, you can buy one Ripple, it'll probably last you your whole life. On, well, on the platform, even a bank that's doing tons and tons of transactions. Sure. And, and well, if you go to the Ripple website, what they're really trying to push is there is different methods of, of using the Ripple system. And one of the methods that does use the XRP tokens, what they're trying to do is they're trying to offer bigger discounts in, in what uh, the cost is of these transactions. So, uh, but the thing is, is that it's not costing a lot to begin with. Maybe if there's like high frequency, like huge volume and, and numbers of transactions, there might be a need to discount that. But at the moment, why would a why would a bank want to hold a volatile cryptocurrency when they don't need to? So Ripple was implemented as a fiat payment thing before before the current incarnation came around. This Canadian with the name of Ryan Fugger decided that he was going to release the open source software and he actually abandoned the project saying there's a chicken and egg problem. People don't use it because it's not useful and people, uh, and it's not useful because people don't use it. And, and so this reincarnation of it, I, I don't think, I think it's going to have similar issues. I, I mean, to actually use it, you have to get a trusted path, uh, with, you know, with an active user in the, in the system. And then you've got to make, get more and more paths to, to, to uh, get more and more um, uh, flexibility with the system. I, I just, I, I, th- I really like the idea when it first came out way before this Ripple XRP thing happened. But um, yeah, but it's, but it's had problems in the past and I, I, it could, those very, that very well could continue. I, 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 it's almost one of those things where nearly everybody who is holding Ripple are just holding it as speculators. Like the number of people who are actually using the currency, using it to do something, using the utility of the currency, I think is infinitesimally small when you compare it to the people holding it, hoping to get rich because they were able to buy a hundred thousand of them when it was less than a penny or, you know, it was one, a few, a few cents. So I think that's what it is, is you have this people this, who have a glut of, of tokens that they want to see go up to five or ten dollars and then they can sell the tokens. And that's all it's about. Maybe that's what happened, JJ. But, but I mean, this is not unique to Ripple. It's, no. it's 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 pervasive in the whole space. I would say, 
Like it doesn't matter what the merit behind the thing is. And there is some merit behind the Ripple system. It doesn't matter what merit is behind it because people are buying and selling based on more or less speculation. That's right. And, and that's not a, a use case that will be sustainable. Well, Germany won't tax Bitcoin users for using cryptocurrencies as a means of payment. In guidance published this past Thursday, Germany's Ministry of Finance, with regard to Bitcoin as the equivalent to legal tender for tax purposes when it's used for payment. This is in contrast to the U.S., where the IRS classifies cryptocurrencies as capital subject to capital gains taxes. Right. Now, that's a little... Yes, there's capital gains taxes, but I think this is more like a sales tax or a use fee or something like that that they're referring to. And yeah. I imagine if you... Like, for example, uh, we're in New Hampshire that has no sales tax here, but just to the south of us is, is Massachusetts, which does have a sales tax. And I imagine if you're a vendor in Massachusetts and you are accepting crypto for some vended some good in your retail store that you're 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 assessing sales tax to that purchase yep. yeah and that's that's i mean if you're going to live in a place that has sales tax that's kind of the way i would expect things to work you're not just going to get around but, but sales I think, tax cuz you use a different currency but i think what this means is in in germany a german taxpayer that maybe cashed out crypto for, for, for cash or for gift card, like, for example, Best Buy gift or Amazon gift cards, and use it as a means of payment doesn't have to, you know, declare gains on it, yeah, whereas so, we do. So, yeah, yeah. But, but my concern is with, like, the value-added tax, where if you made your initial purchase of Bitcoin, if you had to pay, like, a, a sales tax on that, and then you had to pay sales tax when you spend it, I, I think getting the double hammer, that's a little bit, that's, right. that's just yeah. not right. right. I mean, you put the tax somewhere in the chain, but don't put it twice. Well, the U.S. Department of Justice is, Justice is starting their cryptocurrency strategy. During a February 26th discussion at the Financial Services Roundtable, U.S. Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein Discuss, uh, stated that the DOJ has recently formed a cybersecurity task force to develop, quote, a comprehensive strategy to deal with, quote, the use of cryptocurrencies for money laundering. Now, this is a red herring. I mean, cryptocurrencies aren't really used for money laundering in the sense that they're trying to make it out. So, you know, this boogeyman that the DOJ wants to talk about is just... It's just BS. It, it's just a way for them to justify some jobs of, of needing to bring in some skilled engineers, uh, you know, crypto engineers. But it's just another way to, I mean, how's money laundering happened up until now? now it's been with, you know, national currencies. Most money laundering happens with property and real estate. Uh, most money laundering today doesn't happen with currency at all. It happens with buying big ventures uh, you know, having an offshore tax haven company that invests in some property scheme, then and then two months later sells that property, and now all of a sudden you have, what, what, where does your money come from? Why well, sold the property? Right. You know what I'm saying? That most money laundering isn't even using money anymore. It's using property. It's using assets. It's using capital goods. I mean, I watched Breaking Breaking Bad. I'm I'm. I mean that <laughs> you know that's when you uh, use. You get your car wash, right? That's you buy a car wash. That's how you launder money. Today. That's right. You you buy a business or yeah, real a real estate or, or some it's property, na nail salon, you know, coin operated laundromat, all cash business. So, but then, I mean, but then what do you do with that cash? That's the problem. You can't, you know, moving around lar large amounts of cash draw suspicion. So that, right. So you need a, a car wash saying, well, a lot of my customers paid cash. So Rod Rosenstein, get with the picture. This this whole money laundering cryptocurrencies thing is uh, is like that's from what two thousand so fifteen. Do they need a t t task force to develop a comprehensive strategy to deal with the use of car washes for money laundering? The use of don't don't give them any ideas. Money oh jeez, <laughs> the use of uh, property for uh, you know like real estate for money laundering. You know like you could keep you could make task force in ad in ad infinitum. You know infinitum here. So, Honestly, yeah. the DOJ should be spending their time on a lot of other things than uh, money laundering with crypto. I mean, just, just look at the news cycle that's happened in America recently. I don't, I'm not going to name it, but there have been things that happened here that uh, the DOJ should be more focused on than this. But yeah, I mean, like, the, but why? Like, because they're that, that would require they actually do work. 
Yeah. You know, this, they can sit in their office and say cryptos are bad. Urgh. Like the FBI had some information that could have saved some lies, JJ. That's right. I believe. That's right. Yep. Exactly. And, and law enforcement. So, and, and there's no follow up, no nothing, no, no discussion, yeah. anything. Well, what about that Bitcoin? Bitcoin? Bitcoin's. Bitcoin SegWit. This is a funny story. So, Bitcoin SegWit adoption climbs to over 30%. In welcome news to the Bitcoin SegWit chain, SegWit use is steadily increasing after Bitcoin version 16 was released with native uh, SegWit support. So it's a lot easier uh, to use SegWit. You could have used it before now, but it, it's a lot easier to use it in the chain. And also there have been um, exchanges, um, I believe Coinbase and BitPay are now doing SegWit. So a reduced number of average transactions along with SegWit use increase and exchanges batching transactions. This has essentially cleared the mempool where it sits at less than 3,000 unconfirmed transactions with resulting fees being drastically reduced from their highs. And this is a huge difference compared to when unconfirmed transactions are over a quarter of a million in late December 2017. But the question remains as to how Bitcoin SegWit will be able to deal with the spike in transactions during the next bull run in price. Yeah, this, yeah. this is really interesting, like, you know, how... The Bitcoin client development has gone. They introduced multi-sig at the protocol level, and there's no graphical interface for it. They inter and then they introduced SegWit at the protocol level, and there's no graphical interface for it, at least when it was introduced. And so I was just wondering if, if they were ever going to have graphical interfaces for these other things. Well, it turns out we know now that, yes, there is one for SegWit. Yeah, so, you know, and... and this is it's good to see that that the the changes is actually the changes are being used instead of <laughs> being told don't yeah. use segwit it's more it's more costly for the the, the internet or the the network you know it's back when the 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 fees were 70 to 100 dollars to move bitcoin here's the thing yeah the the unconfirmed transactions should be down because a lot of merchants left bitcoin right i got news for you and people stopped too. using it yeah customers too i mean you know, the only reason you would use it as a customer is if you have to, more or less. So that's the only thing they accept. That's the way I look at right. So, So multiple reasons as to why we are here. So it'll be interesting when there is another uptick in price and excitement in, in the crypto market and a lot of uh, rush of new money. That's when we'll see, you know, uh, how good SegWit is, is going to be. Yeah, but it's, it can't be better than just double the, the block size. So. Well, and, and not only is that, you know, there's, there's, I've been watching some, some videos from Rick Falkfinch, uh, if, if you guys, the, the CEO of Bitcoin Cash. Uh, yeah, that's kind of a joke. But it's, it's, a, it's a joke, yeah, of yeah, course. Yeah. But he's been really critical of uh, the Lightning Network. Uh, he's been really critical of Bitcoin Core. And in some of these videos, he's laying out how the idea of the Lightning Network is never going to happen, how Blockstream has basically become defunct. He's saying that people are leaving the Blockstream team, that the, the VCs are just going to be out of their money, their $100 well, million. Dollars. Well, they took their page down of who they employ, like right. who their team is. So that very well could be happening, and we don't know because they're not reporting who's working for them. And Greg, the, Greg Maxwell was in the process of quitting for a couple months before it was public knowledge. And, and the, basically it boils down to this for the Lightning Network. Um, he does a good job of explaining how, in, in a very uh, you know nutshell view of how routing happens in the internet, of how my packet of data that I want from that website travels from that website through the backbone and to me. And what he's what he's basically come up, uh, what he's saying about the Lightning Network is that it doesn't have any routing built into it. It's 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 the routing has been uh, just. It, it, it's, it's just not been fully developed, for one, and the routing table will change with each transaction because in order for you to use a node, you have to first make sure that that node has enough liquidity for your transaction. And so it's like you're, you're checking each node before you send it, or you, it's, it's, you know, as, as the network is being used and liquidity is shifting back and forth, like how do you know when each node is going to be able to be uh, used? Yeah, I mean, it's, it sets up a, a traveling salesman type problem, especially if you're trying to minimize the fee that you pay as you as you have a multi jump route uh, when you're making a payment there, you know, and traveling salesman problems are hard. And when I was, you know, and I'm the, this is a mathematician speaking here. I mean, like early in my life, they said, oh, the traveling salesman problem is is an unsolvable 
but I, I've got a device in my pocket, thanks to Google, that pretty much does a pretty good job of, of solving that problem. But you pretty much have to go to Google standards or Google, you know, Google scale to do this. And, and, and that's, um, that's not really feasible on a blockchain decentralized, all that stuff. I don't think, I mean, you know, prove me wrong, fine. But, uh, and that's just one part of it. That's not the whole everything together so uh so yeah be careful out there so so couple the news of the block stream uh basically fizzling um then lightning network obviously it's, it might not even come to fruition even if it does come to fruition it probably won't work yeah and it's live on the main net now but it's very dangerous to use people have lost funds and they will the test to yeah the test net reports test of the net, test net have fun on test net you won't lose any money i mean it's right. fake money so do it on the test net but don't do it with real fun real money that you want to keep and then finally the last straw it, with all the stuff going on with Bitcoin and uh, Bitcoin SegWit, uh, is is the the fact that now the talk of of changing the algorithm, the proof of work algorithm, once again is I being think, brought uh, up. That's going to be a disaster. Bitcoin Cobra Dash Luke Dash Junior. It's like why 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 would you want to change the algorithm I mean, now? A little bit before the fork. Yes, you're concerned with how that will play out, but right now, I mean, they're both working. It's it's running. I mean, I I think there is a Nash equilibrium problem on the on the Bitcoin Segwit side, but but the, there are minor. There's mining operations that have spent hundreds of millions of dollars on mining equipment. And yeah, the, the, they're not just going to walk away from that. They're, they're not, not going to support that. Yeah, they're not going to walk away. Some of them will switch to Bitcoin Cash if in, in the hypothetical proof of work. Thing, some of them probably will turn off because it won't be worth the power to, to run. And uh, and you're going to have a lot of bad blood with your miners out there if, if Bitcoin did something like this. And, and one final thing before we go here, I, yeah, we've, we've gotten a very few, but a couple complaints from people whenever uh, mentioning the fact that we use the words Bitcoin SegWit. And they're upset. They're upset about us saying SegWit well, to describe that chain. And... I'm. I mean, I'm not going to say I'm sorry that, that for that because the, the reason we're doing that is clarity. We want to make sure that the people listening to us know that we're not talking about Bitcoin Cash, but also at the same point, that we're not talking about the old version of Bitcoin. We're talking about the current version of Bitcoin SegWit because for the history of Bitcoin, for the first eight years, you know, it was just like Bitcoin Cash. Right. Okay. Yeah. That, that's really Bitcoin Cash is the continuation. Of it, all it is is a simple block size increase. It's very simple. There was a signature change and stuff like that, but you know, but it's it's just very you know house dressing type issues, right? So that's the reason we do it because it's more than just right now, and it's more than just Bitcoin Cash. But if you look at the totality, the sum of Bitcoin since it started with the Genesis block, what we have now is not Bitcoin; it is Bitcoin Segwit. And right. So that's why we say it. Yeah, it's something different. So. Any content on the Neo Cash Radio podcast on our website should not be regarded as fan financial or legal advice. Please be mindful of any and all regulations regarding cryptocurrency in your particular jurisdiction. Never invest or gamble more than you're willing to lose and always safeguard your digital currency by keeping it in a wallet whose private keys you control for Neo Cash Radio. This is JJ. This is Darren. This is Pedro. Neo Cash Radio. We discuss the future of money today. NeoCashRadio.com. Keep your keys safe.